Good morning, scholars. Today, we are going to begin the new read aloud of The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. We are going to read chapters one and two in this video. Chapter one, there is no one left. When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselthwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everybody said that she was the most disagreeable looking child ever seen. It was true too. She had a little thin face and a little thin body, thin hair, and a sour expression. Her hair was yellow and her face was yellow because she had been born in India and had always been ill in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government and had always been busy and ill himself. And her mother had been a great beauty who cared only to go to parties and amuse herself with other people. She had not wanted a little girl at all. And when Mary was born, she handed her over to the care of an ayah, who was made to understand that if she wished to please the Mem Sahib, she must keep the child out of sight as much as possible. So when she was a sickly, fretful, ugly little baby, she was kept out of the way. And when she was a sickly, fretful, toddling thing, she was kept out of the way also. She never remembered seeing familiarly anything but the dark faces of her ayah and the other native servants. And as they always obeyed her and gave her her own way in everything, because the Mem Sahib would be angry if she was disturbed by her crying, by the time she was six years old, she was as tyrannical and selfish a little pig as ever lived. The young English governess who came to teach her to read and write disliked her so much that she gave up her place in three months. And when other governesses came to try to fill it, they always went away in a shorter time than the first. So if Mary had not chosen to really know how to read books, she would never have learned her letters at all. One frightfully hot morning, when she was about nine years old, she awakened feeling very cross and she became crosser still when she saw that the servant who stood by her bedside was not her ayah. This is an illustration of Miss Mary Lennox. At this part in chapter one, Mary has become an orphan. Now an orphan is someone whose both parents have um, passed away, they are no longer alive. Chapter two. Mary had liked to look at her mother from a distance and she had thought her very pretty. But as she knew very little of her, she could scarcely have been expected to love her or to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact. And as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thought to herself, as she had always done. If she had been older, she would have no doubt have been very anxious about being left alone in the world. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people who would be polite to her and give her her own way as her ayah and the other native, native servants had done. She knew that she was not going to stay at the English clergyman's house where she was taken at first. She did not want to stay. The English clergyman was poor and he had already had five children nearly all the same age and they wore shabby clothes and were always quarreling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow and was so disagreeable to them that after the first day or two, nobody would play with her. By the second day, they had given her a nickname which made her furious. It was Basil who thought of it first. Basil was a little boy with impudent blue eyes and a turned up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under the tree, and she was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden when Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently, he got rather interested and suddenly made a suggestion. Why don't you put a heap of stones there and pretend it's a rookery, he said. They're in the middle, and he leaned over to point. Go away, cried Mary. I don't want boys, go away. For a moment, Basil looked angry and then he began to tease. 
He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her and made faces and sang and laughed. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. He sang it until the other children heard and laughed too. And the crosser Mary got, the more they sang Mistress Mary, quite contrary, when they spoke to, of her to each other and often when they spoke to her. You are going to be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week, and we're glad of it. I am glad of it too, answered Mary. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil, with seven-year-old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmama lives there, and our sister Mabel was sent to her last year. You are not going to your grandmama. You have none. You are going to your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't, Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great, big, desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. He's so cross he wouldn't let them, and they wouldn't come if he let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I don't believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears because she would not listen any more. But she thought it over a great deal afterward, and when Mrs. Crawford told her that night that she was going to sail away to England in a few days and to go to her uncle, Mr. Archibald Craven, who lived at Misselthwaite Manor, she looked so stony and stubbornly uninterested that they did not know what to think of her. They tried to be kind to her, but she only turned her face away when Mrs. Crawford attempted to kiss her, and she held herself stiffly when Mr. Crawford patted her shoulder. She is such a plain child, Mrs. Crawford said pityingly afterward, and her mother was such a pretty creature. She had a pretty manner too, and Mary has the most unattractive ways I have ever seen in a child. The children call her Mistress Mary quite contrary. Although it is naughty of them, one can't help understanding it. Perhaps if her mother had carried her pretty face and her pretty manners oftener into the nursery, Mary might have learned some pretty ways too. It is very sad. Now the poor girl, beautiful thing is gone. To remember that many people never even knew that she had a child at all. I believe she scarcely ever looked at her, sighed Mrs. Crawford. When her Aya was gone, there was no one to give her a thought to the little thing. Think of the servants running away and leaving her all alone in that deserted bungalow. Colonel McGrew said he nearly jumped out of his skin when he opened the door and found her standing by herself in the middle of the room. Mary made the long voyage to England under the care of an officer's wife, who was taking her own children to leave them in a boarding school. She was very much absorbed in her own little boy and girl and was rather glad to hand over the child to the woman Mr. Archibald Craven had sent to meet her in London. The woman was his housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor and her name was Mrs. Med Medlock. She was a stout woman with very red cheeks and sharp black eyes. She wore a very purple dress, a black silk mantle with jet fringe on it and a black bonnet with purple velvet flowers which stuck up and trembled when she moved her head. Mary did not like her at all. But as she very seldom liked people, there was nothing remarkable in that. Besides, which it was very evident Mrs. Medlock did not think much of her. My word, she's a plain little piece of goods, she said, and we had heard that her mother was a beauty. She hasn't handed down much of it, has she, ma'am? Perhaps she will improve as she grows older, the officer's wife said good-naturedly. If she were not so sallow and had a nicer expression, her features would be rather good. Children alter so much. She'll have to alter a great deal, answered Mrs. Medlock, and there's nothing likely to improve children at Misselthwaite, if you ask me. They thought Mary was not listening because she was standing a little apart from them at the window of a private hotel that they had gone to. She was watching the passing buses and cabs and people, but she heard quite well 
and she was made very curious about her uncle and the place that he lived in. What sort of place was it? And what would it be like? What was a hunchback? She had never seen one. Perhaps there were none in India. Since she had been living in other people's houses and had no ayah, she had begun to feel lonely and to think strange thoughts which were new to her. She had begun to wonder why she had never seemed to belong to anyone, even when her father and her mother had been alive. Other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she never seemed to be anyone's little girl. She had had servants and, foods and food and clothes, and no one had taken notice of her. She did not know that this was because she was a disagreeable child. But then, of course, she did not know she was disagreeable. She often thought that other people were, but she did not know that she was herself. She thought Mrs. Medlock was the most disagreeable person she had ever seen, with her common, high-colored face and her common, fine bonnet. When the next day they set out to their journey to Yorkshire, she walked through the station of the railway carriage with her head up and trying to keep as far away as she could because she did not want to seem to belong to her. It would have made her very angry to think people imagined she was her little girl. But Mrs. Medlock was not the least disturbed by her and her thoughts. She was the kind of woman who would stand no nonsense from young ones. At least that is what she would have said if she had been asked. She had not wanted to go to London just when her sister Maria's daughter was going to be married, but she had a comfortable, well-paid place as a housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and the only way in which she could keep it was to do at once what Mr. Archibald Craven told her to do. She never dared to even ask a question. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother and I am her, their daughter's guardian. The child ha is to be brought here. You must go to London and bring her yourself. So she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. She had nothing to read or to look at and she had folded her thin little black gloved hands in her lap. Her black dress made her look more yellow than ever and her limp light hair straggled from under her black crepe hat. A more marred looking young one I'd never saw in my life, Mrs. Medlock thought. Marred is a Yorkshire word that means spoiled and pettish. She had never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything. And at last she got tired of watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. I suppose I may well tell you something about where you're going to, she said. Do you know anything about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father or any mother talk about him? No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that her father and her mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Certainly, they had never told her things. Hmph, muttered Mrs. Medlock, staring at her unresponsive little face. She did not say any more for a few moments, and then she began again. I suppose uh, you might as well be told something to prepare you. You are going to a strange place. Mary said nothing at all, and Mrs. Medlock looked rather discomfited by her indifference. But after taking a breath, she went on. Not that it's a big, grand place in a gloomy way, and Mr. Craven's proud of it in his way, and that's gloomy enough, too. The house is 600 years old, and it's on the edge of the moor, and there's a hundred rooms in it, though most of them shut up and locked. And there's pictures and fine old furniture and things that's been there for ages. And there's a big park round it and gardens and trees with branches trailing to the ground, some of them. She paused and took another breath. But there's nothing else, she ended suddenly. Mary had begun to listen in spite of herself. It all sounded so unlike India and anything new rather attracted her. But she did not intend to look as if she were interested. That was one of her unhappy, disagreeable ways. So she sat still. Well, said Mrs. Medlock, what do you think of it? Nothing, 
she answered. I know nothing about such places. That made Mrs. Medlock laugh, a sh short sort of laugh. Eh, she said, but you were like an old woman, don't you care? It doesn't matter, said Mary, whether I care or not. You are right enough, said Mrs. Medlock. It doesn't. What you're to be kept at Misselthwaite Manor, for I don't know, unless it's because it's the easiest way. He's not going to trouble himself about you. That's sure and certain. He never troubles himself about no one. She stopped herself as if she had just remembered something in time. He's got a crooked back, she said. That's set wrong. He was a sour young man and got no good for all of his money and big place till he was married. Mary's eyes turned toward her in spite of her intention not to seem to care. She had never thought of the hunchback being married and she was a trifle surprised. This is Mrs. Medlock and this is Mary. Mrs. Medlock saw this and as she was a talkative woman, she continued with more interest. This was one way of passing some of the time at any rate. She was a sweet pretty thing and he'd walk the world over to get her a blade of grass if she wanted. Nobody thought she'd marry him, but she did, and people said she married him for his money. But she didn't. She didn't. When she died, Mary gave a little involuntary jump. Oh, did she die? She exclaimed, quite without meaning to. She had just remembered a French story. It had been about a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess, and it made her suddenly feel sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven. Yes, she died, Mrs. Medlock answered, and it made him stranger than ever. He cares about nobody. He won't see people. Most of the time he goes away, and when he is at Misselthwaite Manor, he shuts himself up in the West Wing and won't let anybody but Pitcher see him. Pitcher's an old fellow, but he took care of him when he was a child, and he knows his ways. It sounded like something in a book, and it did not make Mary feel cheerful. A house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up with their doors locked, a house on the edge of a moor, whatever a moor was, sounded dreary. A man with a crooked back who shut himself up also? She stared out the window with her lips pinched together, and it seemed quite natural that the rain should have begun to pour in gray slanting lines and splash and stream down the window panes. If the pretty wife had been alive, she might have made things cheerful by being something like her own mother and by running in and out of, of going to parties as she had done in frocks full of lace. But she was not there anymore. You needn't expect to see him because 10 to one you won't, Mrs. Medlock said. And you mustn't expect that there will be people to talk to you. You'll have to play about and look after yourself. You'll, ha you'll be told what rooms you can go into and what rooms you're keeping out of. There's gardens enough. But when you're in the house, don't go wandering and poking about. Mr. Craven won't have it. I shall not want to go poking about said sour little Mary, just as suddenly as she had begun to be rather sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven. She began to cease to be sorry and to think that he was unpleasant enough to deserve all that had happened to him. And she turned to her face toward the streaming panes of the window of the railway carriage and gazed out at the gray rainstorm, which looked as if it would go on forever and ever. She watched it so long and steadily that the grayness grew heavier and heavier before she fell asleep.